Greetings, can you hear me? <laughs> uh, welcome to the Distinguished African Lecture Series. We're really pleased to have such a great showing, especially on this freezing cold mid-January day. Um, <laughs> I do feel it's a bit unfair that we are suffering this way so soon. But we are here for a very good reason, and that is to hear from Toby Green. And I will give you a little background on Toby, and then I will turn the floor over to him. Um, Toby comes to us via King's College. He earned, his, he earned his first degree in philosophy at Cambridge, and then he worked as a writer and editor, and he published several books that were published in various languages. He then went on, African history captured his interest, and he then did a doctorate at the Center of West African Studies at Birmingham University, and he completed a PhD on the history of Cape Verde in 2007. He then held a postdoc at Birmingham and then went on, took up residency at King's, becoming a lecturer in Lusophone African History and Culture in 2013. His book on the transatlantic slave trade, The Rise of the Transatlantic Slave Trade in Western Africa, 1300 to 1589, constitutes an important contribution to the history of the slave trade, to the historiography of the slave trade. Among the many things that it does well, and importantly, is to challenge historians to move beyond numbers and quantities to study the slave trade. Green has, it is required reading these days if you are doing a course on Africa and the slave trade, and it is required in my classes as well. Green has likewise made contributions to the study of new Christians and the transatlantic diasporas that they have constructed, as well as to the links and relationships that emerged between Brazil and Africa in the 16th and 19th centuries. It is notable that Green's boundless intellectual curiosity has also found other forms. He has written a memoir of sorts, as well as fiction, and histories aimed at a more popular audience. It is an impressive outpouring indeed. I have a feeling, given this broad array of interests, and I really do encourage you to look at everything that he's published on his yeah, website, yeah, yeah. on his website. I have this feeling, given this broad array of interests, that Green's restive mind can reach in many directions at once and that he manages many research and writing projects simultaneously. I sense furthermore that this is someone who finds deep satisfaction in committing the written word to paper and to exploring our human species and our intertwined histories and relationships. This is all pure speculation, however. Whatever the, or the origin or reason for being of Toby's scholarship, I can say that it is always a pleasure to read his creative and stimulating investigations, whatever form they take. And now I will turn the floor over to him so that we may, may all learn from Green's expansive intellect and, and Green outpouring, which on this day will focus on hard and soft currencies and the origins of inequalities in Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, everybody, for being here in this weather. Uh, it's, it's, it's good of you, and um, I think the secret of, uh, of my intellectual outpourings is it's just a bad habit, which I can't kick. <laughs> but, um, it's, it's really great to be here with you all, and I say thank you for coming. I, I'm, 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 I'm going to share with you to, uh, this evening really what I've been up to the last two or three years and how, how I'm trying to turn that into uh, working towards my next book. Um, which, I hope, which I hope to be about um, economic history and, and West Africa's economic history and relationship to, uh, to, well, the relationship between changes in West Africa's economic history in the period in which my monograph was about, in the 16th century, but into the 17th and 18th centuries, and how that relates to the widening gap uh, in economic terms between West Africa and the West of the world. What, what was the economic relationship between West Africa and the rest of the world at this period? And how did that change at this time? That's the, that's the overall way, way in which the, the book is going to take shape. So that's the sort of thing I'm going to explore with you. Um, and I'm going to start with a story. And the story is, how, in a sense, how I got interested in this subject. And there are various things. But one thing that sticks in my mind is when I was doing some research in, in the Gambia a few years ago, I arrived and uh, a fr a fr I met a friend and we went to change some money. I brought with me some euro notes. I, 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 I had three euro notes, and for my three euro notes, I got a very large bag of money. And I said to my friend Buba, I said, I don't really understand economics. 
how can I come with three notes and get this? It doesn't really make sense to me. And Buber said, it doesn't really seem very fair. And that's, it, it's sunk in to me, actually. It, 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 of course it isn't fair. But then, as a historian, you know, I'm, I, I'm interested as to how that process came about. How did that process take shape? So that's, that's, that's where I, in a sense, where I began this current project. And that's perhaps one of the things to get me interested in, in the interaction of present and past inequalities and the ways in which present inequalities m may have been constructed in the past. I am a historian, as, as Emily said, of what might be called the deep African past. My monograph starts in 1300. It goes through to 1589. But that was always something of an accident. Um, what got me interested in that deep past was actually my experiences of doing research in West Africa, of trying to understand how West Afri the parts of West Africa which I know best, uh, which are quite close to the areas which Emily's done her research in, uh, Senegal, Guinea-Bissau, the Gambia, how, how they came to be as they are. And I, I, I figured in order to understand how those areas came to be as they were, I needed to know a lot about the past. And so I started going back and back and back. Uh, and when I reached 1300, I thought I'd gone about far enough. <laughs> I've stopped that for the time being. And so I've now started to move forwards. Because I've always been, as, as I've said, very much engaged in the African present, the West African present, in terms of research and interests. And in fact, my most recent book, which is, a, I think, a new one for, for Emily as well, is actually an edited volume. One of my colleagues at King's College was uh, Patrick Chabal. <coughs> Patrick was a great uh, political scientist uh, and historian. He, he wrote the key uh, biography of Amilcar Cabral, the, the liberation leader of Guinea-Bissau, uh, key works on... Uh, Lucifer and African literature. He was a very interdisciplinary. He died in January. Uh, we were editing a book together on Guinea-Bissau. Uh, and the crisis of the state in contemporary Guinea-Bissau, because Guinea-Bissau is one of the countries where I've done a lot of my research. And, and, and so, as I say, I, I was always, I've always been very interested in the present and very engaged in the present, even though I, I work in the past. And in Guinea-Bissau, since 1998, I first went to the country in 1995, and three years after that, there was a coup and since then, there's been multiple, uh, there have been multiple political instabilities, uh, and there's been a relationship between that and growing a growing cocaine trade through from Colombia through Guinea-Bissau. This is now one of the major gateways for the cocaine trade uh, to Europe, and all of this has been happening alongside a, a tremendous deterioration in the role of the state in the country. And. And so one of the themes of the book is the ways in which current political configurations may be related to historical relations of economic inequality. Let's just think for a moment of the story I just told you about my friend Buba in, in the Gambia and, and, this idea, and the question of how hard and soft currencies and, and, and the way in which they were formed historically may relate to some of the things I've been looking at in this book on Guinea-Bissau. When we think of currencies in flux in the contemporary world, the story is of the rise of unheralded currencies from the BRIC nations, the Brazilian real, the South African rand area, the Chilean peso, all currencies which have appreciated mark markedly since the world economic crisis began in 2008. But we don't hear about the Ghanaian Sedi, the Nigerian Naira, the Gambian Dalasi in the same breath, even though this is supposed to be, as the, our financial pages of our newspapers tell us, the era of Africa rising. What is it about the interactions between West African and global economies over the long durée which might explain this? Can we locate the origins of contemporary political and economic instability, such as those in Guinea-Bissau, in, in, in the distant past? And how might those two things relate, the, the current political dispensation in a country like Guinea-Bissau and, and, and these distant exchanges, which I've also been researching? So those are the sorts of questions I want, I'd like to address with you tonight. So I'm going to begin thinking a little bit about this book I've been working on with, with my late colleague, Patrick Chabal, on, on Guinea-Bissau. And, and the question is, why try to connect events and periods of time which are so distinct from each other? What does economic change in the 17th and 18th centuries really have to do with political conditions in the 21st century? It's, a good, it's an important question. It deserves a clear answer. As Shini Mbembe has shown, it's crucial to situate current events within the long historical continuum, which is structured the growing inequality between West Africa and the rest of the global economic system. Understanding the deep-rooted historical patterns of contemporary conjunctures was also actually a concern of, of Patrick Chabal's. It's the question of the structural framework, which is at the heart of what I try to analyze. And I'm reminded here of uh, the Haitian uh, anthropologist Michel Rolf Triot, 
in his book Silencing the Past, which is a great book, I don't know if, if people know it here, it was published in 1995. Um, he, he had a very pungent critique. It's a book about, about the ways in which parts of history can be occluded, and he, ha he has a very important chapter on Haiti in the late 18th century and the, and the revolution. Uh, and in that chapter, he has this amazing critique of slave owners' analyses of patterns of resistance in the 18th century Caribbean, I quote, Planters and managers could not fully deny resistance, but they tried to provide reassuring certitudes by trivializing all its manifestations. Resistance did not exist as a global phenomenon. Rather, each case of unmistakable defiance, each possible instance of resistance was treated separately and drained of its political content. Slave A ran away because he was particularly mistreated by his master. Slave B was missing because he was not properly fed. Slave X killed herself in a fatal tantrum. Slave Y poisoned her mistress because she was jealous. But to acknowledge resistance as a mass phenomenon is to acknowledge the possibility that something is wrong with the system, he said Creole. I think similarly, when we look at the post-colonial state, focusing on individual causes and individual solutions within the ongoing problematic of neo-colonialism in, in Africa, fails to entertain the possibility that systemic issues also need to be addressed and placed within both a historical and a contemporaneous structural context. As Mbembe also put it, I quote, African politics and econom economics have been condemned to appear in social theory only as the sign of a lack, while the discourse of political science and development economics has become that of a quest for the causes of that lack. So, my suggestion is that there's a tremendous emphasis on individual causes and individual effects, but that systems also matter. This interest in systems is, of course, deeply unfashionable, and you may be able to tell already I'm not particularly interested in fashion. Uh, in much African history, especially pre-colonial Atlantic African history, focuses on micro-histories. Recently, scholars like Rocinaldo Ferreira argue that these micro-histories reveal and embody broader structures in a more telling and humane way that previous than previous work, which used to focus directly on those structures, could do. And this trend in the literature is also found in recent generalist approaches to the study of the West African past, like the recent book by uh, Randy Sparks on Anna Mabo on the Gold Coast. So what's wrong with that? It's a very understandable approach to history, humanizing individual experiences in a context where the individual is becoming more and more significant in our discourse. Yet the idea that it is the individual story which can always best exemplify the process of history seems to me also to concede too much territory to neoliberalism. By focusing on the individual, we replicate an ideology of choice, the pattern of consumer activism and influence on the political process, which is seen in many streams of discourse today as the best way in which we can influence change for the better. It's through consumption that good things will come. Is that really so? I grew up in the 80s. I'm a child of Thatcher. You can have Reagan. <laughs> Investing the locus of political change in the individual, that was the idea. Seeking to understand political change through the individual seems to be in some ways the end point of an ideological war of attrition which has left the study of structures in poor shape. So focusing only on micro-histories may make us fall into what I will call the trio trap after the excerpt I just read to you from Silencing the Past. We focus on the experience of X, the travails of Y, the problems of Z, all as exemplifications of a system and experience which themselves remain unquantified, unexamined, uncritiqued in a broad sense. And also, one of the problems with microhistory, especially when we look into the deeper past, is that it's very easy to fall prey to the danger of archival reductivism. Only voices which created individual journeys through the archival trail can be rescued, and that leaves many more voices uncounted. So I'm not suggesting we should dispense with microhistories. I love Rocky Aldo's book dearly. It's a great book. But I think that they shouldn't encourage us to dispense with considering the wider structural bounds which shape them. And that's why I think, as I'll, I'll explain in a moment, we need to look at the economic systems and the structures in the era of the transatlantic slave trade in that light. Let's return to the relationships between the present political structures of West Africa and the wider question of long-term inequality, economic inequalities raised by Mbembe. There's now a wide body of work that argues that the state in Africa is a pseudo-Western facade. It serves to mask personalized political relations. Its role in resource extraction is to the benefit of African and European elites. This neo-patrimonial construction of the state is predicated on a weak view of institutionalization, a lack of resources, a legacy of a violent, unequal, and authoritarian predecessor colonial state. And drawing on that framework, many works, like a recent strong edited book, edited book by Ogaba Agbese and Clay Kier Jr., uh, 
have noted the role of the state as a system of private enrichment for political elites in many countries in post-colonial Africa, and the legacy of illegitimacy of authority which this creates. Now, to the extent that these critiques cite a lack of strong institutions, this neo-patrimonial critique is related to the Washington Consensus, of course, the institutional theory of economics, which has been in vogue for the past two decades. But there are strands of it which run deeper and relate to longer-term patterns of inequality. The hist for example, we can think about this historical construction of the colonial state, which is unequal, it's all authoritarian, and it brings historical patterns into this framework of the development of the post-colonial state. And if we go back to Mbembe, Mbembe notes post-colonial states were heavily shaped by long-standing patterns of long-distance trade and the ways in which African societies were integrated into world trade. So Mbembe thinks you have to look at this uh, long-distance trade in the historical context to understand the way in which post-colonial states were shaped. So in actual fact, if you look at the construction of the post-colonial state and the way in which it's theorized, that theorization relies on important deep-rooted historical strands, and that's recognized in the literature. And that offered, and, and this kind of construction which is offered by recognizing the further developments of colonial patterns of hierarchy and authoritarianism, and offered by recognizing the pattern of trading inequalities which relates to this deep past. So what I'm suggesting is the question concerning legitimacy of political authority, problems faced by the post-colonial state in offering requisite guarantees that states offer citizens in terms of security and stability, can relate to deeper historical patterns, which focusing on immediate causes, immediate solutions, don't actually resolve. Or to put it another way, could developmentalism as a paradigm address issues of inequality both within Africa and between Africa and the rest of the world? Developmentalism doesn't pretend to address inequality at all, but rather development within the existing paradigm. Yet that paradigm embeds inequality. Developmentalism has grown in the past 30 years, and so has inequality. So focusing squarely on the present, on present issues, masks issues of structure. And I think this view of the dangers of the trio trap becomes especially clear when we examine the place of the idea of patrimonialism within structural inequality. The economist Thomas Piketty has recently argued famously that Western countries are returning to a patrimonial economic system structured around massive inequality that is determined by aggregated weight of inherited capital. And this is in view of the fact of the continuing widening of the gulf, as we all know, the widening inequality between top percentiles and the rest of the population, both in, in individual nation states and across the world. And this, of course, replicates patterns familiar from Africa and from other world regions like Brazil and India, where the personalization of wealth and power through neo-patrimonialism is so acute. So as inequality rises in the 21st century, there's a growing questioning of the legitimacy of the state, not only in Africa, but actually increasingly in Western democracies, as we all know, characterized by lowering voter turnout in Europe, the rise in popular support of protest parties, like, for example, in, in my own country, the United Kingdom Independence Party, as they like to call themselves. The structural factor of inequality is common and relates fundamentally to growing problems of representation on a global scale, to structures which individual examples, individual causes, individual solutions are ill-equipped to explain. And I think that analysis illuminates much of what's wrong with responses of the international community to events in a country like Guinea-Bissau in the last 15 years. And that's one of the things that our book addresses. After each coup in Guinea or each associated political crisis, efforts were made by international actors to address the specific crisis to resolve it. But the structural issues which provoke the crisis and the arena of crisis are unresolved. And indeed, actually, they tend to be exacerbated by growing inequalities, which I've been talking about. And so the instability continues. So where do the origins of those structural issues lie? Can thinking historically about them help us to identify them more clearly and to consider potential resolutions. That's what I'm working on at the moment in my research on currencies in the pre-colonial era. So that's what I'm going to sh discuss with you now. It's not that we can think historically about these institutions per se, but rather we can do so around economic structures which may contribute to the difficulties faced by post-colonial states in Africa. These structures of inequality and, and, and rising divisions within both, well, within many countries around the world, which continue to characterize the post-colonial era. So that's what I'm trying to, going to try and do in the remainder of, of, of my talk, is to link what I've discussed now, this structural framework, with what roots there may be if we look at the historical past.
So, in the era of the transatlantic slave trade and in the historiography surrounding the transatlantic slave trade, and I'm as, I, I, I've done this as much as anybody, uh, there's been a huge focus on the history of that execrable trade itself, and this is absolutely right. Of course, how can we fail as human beings who care about the world to place this appalling history at the heart of our engagement with the past of West Africa? It, it, it is impossible to do justice to it, but all historians who care about West Africa have to engage with this history. We'd be redundant as historians, and I would certainly feel redundant if we didn't. But when it comes to the study of this aspect of the, Af of the West African past, of course, we run into historical and ethical minefields, which in some ways hinder rather than assist understanding the consequences of this awful history. And I'm always struck when teaching undergraduate students just how different the history is from what many imagine before they come into the room. It's not a question simply of Europeans seizing Africans, not a question of Africans selling Africans. We remember the work of Mujim Bey that, of course, the category of Africa is invented in this period. It's a, such a complicated history. And there's been a quest, of course, for many decades to show African agency in this period. But the question is beginning to arise, is this actually a mask for an implicit ideological program in the Western Academy to render Africans also culpable for this trade alongside Europeans? What, uh, what are the importance of narratives of guilt as replicating old abolitionist discourses? What of Walter Johnson's critique of the very idea of agency itself? In a very recent article in the Journal of African History, Lisa Lindsay recently argued persuasively that Africa, African agency or, or showing African agency can on some accounts also distract from the inherent violence and inequality that underpins the trade, distract us from how, in Walter Rodney's words, Europe underdeveloped Africa. It's my view that at the heart of these problematics, as they're currently being discussed, is the way in which ideologies of freedom and neoliberal trade come to make trade seem like an end in itself, an unquestionable good. The expansion of trading systems, the expansion of exchange, the globalization of free trade are all unimpeachable moral goods in the current dispensation. But this is an ideological, not a factual construction, which obscures the past as much as it illuminates it. The question of trade, of how we see trade, is at the heart of this. And this has been greatly shaped, of course, by the ideological triumph of neoliberal capitalism, in which, of course, this august institution had a not insubstantial role. To be blunt, was trade really an equal exchange? And does framing it as an exchange between trading partners distort the significance of this history in West Africa? We should be very wary of this ideological construction of trade and free trade as untrammeled goods. Ideologies of free trade, as in a recent book by a, a British scholar, William Pettigrew, called Freedom's Debt, shows the ideology of free trade actually grew out of the European slave trade in West Africa. He shows very clearly in this book how the development of the idea of free trade was used by independent traders in the 18th century in West Africa as part of an attempt to secure their interests. But the ideology wasn't actually as simple as he makes out in that book, although he does reveal that. English slave traders wanted the right to trade freely, but they also wanted the monopoly when it came to the ports of West Africa. They wanted to block up the Dutch, the French, and the Portuguese competition. Meanwhile, as the, as the Bissau Guinean scholar José Liniana Fafé has shown, Kings such as Inchinate of Bissau sought genuine free trade, and they said genuine free trade is that we can trade with the French, the Dutch, and the Portuguese, and the English, that all should have access to their ports. I think that distinction helps us to think a lot about the ideology of free trade as it developed. It's actually a mask for preferential access. The freedom is all on one side, and on the other attempts are made to impose restrictions and monopolies. Every champion of free trade is hoping to gain preferential access, aware that this is precisely an unequal exchange in which the terms of exchange give them the best chance for access and for benef benefiting from that access. And what the rise of the ideology of free trade in the 18th century, which Pettigrew shows us, tells us is precisely the unequal nature of the trade. So choosing apparently neutral terms, such as trade and exchange, mask the real nature of the processes of interaction that were taking place. Concepts of trade mask inequalities. The concept of trade and exchange implies interactions of both sides, a level playing field, there was trade, there was exchange, but these exchanges underpinned widening inequalities. How else are we to explain the reality that in West Africa in this period, trade expanded hugely, and so did inequality? 
Focusing on trade with the concomitant subtext that this offers a benefit for both parties has therefore seriously diminished historians' understanding of the role of this trade in structuring inequality. And it's not surprising that, it, that that has been a difficult nut to crack. For seeing trade as a part of inequality is not a very fashionable viewpoint among economists. I told you I didn't believe in fashions. So my current research is trying to think around these difficulties to be focusing on the history of currency in West Africa in this period. Now this is a field which was once really active in, uh, in African studies uh, in the 70s, uh, the work that Paul Lovejoy wrote a lot about it, in Ikori, Marion Johnson from uh, my old institution at Birmingham, the Centre of West African Studies, wrote some pathfinding works on the history of currency. But actually very little work has been done in it since the 70s and the 80s. Um, the focus of funding agencies, government research councils on development, current causes of economic crises and impact. Still, I've been doing my best. Over the last few years, I've, I've done a lot of research in different archives around the world, in Brazil, in uh, Peru, also in S the Netherlands, Spain, Portugal, and in West Africa, using oral histories in the Gambia. I've been involved in an oral history digitization project in a wonderful archive in, in the Gambia. Um, and this has been very useful in trying to think around some of these issues. So, but why am I interested in the history of currency at all? Fundamentally, because as the title of my talk suggests, I see the origins of the current system of hard and soft currencies, the, what I talk, talked about at the beginning, the story of arriving in the Gambia and that interrelationship, in the exchanges of this era. Looking at the differential value of different items of currency and how that changed allows us to see how inequality between West Africa and the rest of the world grew as a result. We see that global trade, not an engine of growth in West Africa, was actually an engine of impoverishment. One of the interesting things about this topic is that the subject of currency exchanges in a global context is very much in vogue among global historians. This discussion of the great divergence, as Kenneth Pomerantz calls it, between Asian and European economies, the role of silver, which is exported from the Americas to China, and there's a lot of work on this. And in this picture, West Africa is completely written out of the picture. No essay or book of the very many which have been published in recent books on interlinkages of American, Asian, and European economic systems pause to consider the place which West Africa may have had in this process. And no doubt this is because preconceptions still exist among many economic historians regarding African sources and African economies. Economists are interested in economic growth, and introducing West Africa into these discussions may problematize teleological narratives of growth, which is precisely, of course, why it should be done. It's actually absurd to cut West Africa out of these debates. There's a huge amount of evidence of the interlinkage of West African and global economic uh, exchanges at this time. The place of West African gold, illustrated, of course, with the name of the Gold Coast. Beyond gold, in, uh, in the 17th century, in uh, what's now Angola, Democratic Republic of Congo, the major reasons for European interest was actually perceived rich seams of copper, gold, and silver. If you look at maps of Mozambique in the 17th century, they're full of supposed mines of, of these metals and minerals. Um, so those m minerals, which were key, of course, for currencies, were uh, the role of West Africa is clear. And on the other hand, if you link, want to link Asia into the picture, you've got the mass import of cowries to West Africa from the Maldive Islands through European merchant ships. Uh, and this is part of the global currency. It's not just in West Africa that you have cowries. You also have cowries being, being used in China in the 17th century as a currency, in, in Yunnan. But West Africa is not integrated into this picture, which is actually really a bizarre feature of the historiography. So what I'm trying to do is explore in my work the ways in which global patterns of currency trade may have impacted West Africa. What we actually know is that vast amounts of currencies were imported to West Africa during the 16th and 17th centuries, as Joseph Inakori has shown, but that also this tailed off in the 18th century. How did the mass import of locally used currencies, cowries, copper, iron, cloth, how did this affect West Africa's economy? How did this relate to global processes of currency exchange and import? Was there a connection between these increasing imports of currency and the growing trade in enslaved Africans from West Africa? And if so, what was it? How did these connect to West Africa's economic position with re in relation to the rest of the world and to the emergence of what I've described as a hard and soft currency system? Let's first of all think about the consequence on West African economies of the mass import of currencies as part of the trading system related to Atlantic slavery. The, 
Uh, historians Kwame Nimako and Glenn Williamson have recently argued in a work on the Dutch Atlantic that the Atlantic slave trade system has to be seen as part of a global economic system. And if we think about currencies, uh, we begin to see how that might work. As I've already mentioned, one of the major imports was cowrie shells, copper millers, iron bars, cloth. All of those were pre-existing currencies in West Africa. They weren't the start of the currency use. They were pre-existing currencies. So what was the impact of widespread import of pre-existing currencies? The data I've collected underlines the relationship between those imports and currency inflation. In order to trade with the Atlantic system, inflation of local currencies expanded. And of course, and when you have inflation, you need more exports to match these imports. So my fundamental argument is a sort of reversal of the recent work which Nathan Nunn has done, the economist Nathan Nunn, who looks at the causal relationships between the rise of the Atlantic slave trade and economic impoverishment of Africa. The slave trade is a, is, is a symptom of processes of unequal exchange, furthering impoverishment. And one consequence of inflation is precisely the need to e expand exports in order to keep pace with inflation of local currencies. Another important consequence is related to Africa's relative global economic position. What matters for future economic trajectories relating West Africa to the world is the relative value of Africa's currencies. Gold is being exported from West Africa, which depresses the relative value of currencies being imported into West Africa, increases the volume of currencies used within West Africa needed to purchase items of everyday exchange, and expands the internal market for exchange and trade. Demand is not increased, as, hist as Eurocentric historians have tried to argue, for Europe as a special case. Uh, inflation, the price revolution, as it's called, increasing through demographic growth. But it shows that in West Africa, we see that it was through the expansion of the market area and mechanisms of exchange. And the way in which this encouraged the export from much of West Africa of currencies, such as gold, copper, which are actually gaining value in the rest of the world, increasing the divergence in the economic value of the currencies used in West Africa and those in the rest of the world. What I'm thinking about at the moment, therefore, is an attempt to move a model which Paul Lovejoy developed in the 70s in that model, he linked inflation and imperialist expansion in the 19th century. He showed how there was massive inflation of the cowrie currencies in West Africa in the 19th century, and that was linked to key stages of European imperial expansion in Africa. The, the work, the research that I'm doing is trying to move that model back to the 17th century. The evidence I've gathered shows that inflation in West Africa also corresponds to this process. As inflation of local currencies develops in West African economies, the, ex the, the mixed trading economy which previously existed, where you actually have quite a lot of evidence of manufacture from, manufactured cloths from West Africa as part of a global trading system, being exported to places like Brazil, even to New York, to Curaçao. You have evidence of cloths from the regions of the Gold Coast, um, Benin being exported in the 17th century. And these have disappeared by the end of the 17th century, those exports. So inflation of the 17th century is symptomatic of a shift towards the Atlantic slave trade, and away from a more mixed economy in which West African ex uh, manufactured exports were important. So in other words, there is an important pattern. Inflation of locally used currencies produced by mass imports of those currencies on the one hand, and an increase in transatlantic slave trade on the other. At the same time, the relative global value of the currencies in use in, Afri in West Africa has declined because of the increasing global weight of bullion currencies. So the export of gold as part of the global currency trade in which we've seen West Africa was interlinked with many parts of the world went a long way towards exacerbating the weakness of currencies in use in West Africa and initiating the establishment of hard and soft currencies, impoverishing West African economies in relation to the world. Now this may all sound too close to economic determinism to some listeners an approach which goes too far in evading a questions of agency and makes the trade seem too much redu reducible to economics. I want to make it clear that that's not the way in which I'm analyzing the question. There is an important economic content to this. And after all, one of the themes that I'm trying to explore is precisely the divergence in West African economic, between West African economies and global economies in this period. So obviously there's going to be an economic answer to that question. 
But it's also important to, to note that in, in my research, what I'm trying to do is also grasp the social context in which different currencies were used in West Africa. Um, and here, the work of the economic anthropologist Jane Geyer, who some of you may know, is very important. Geyer, uh, in her really important, most imp perhaps her most important, but marginal gains, talks about mutually constituted social meanings and the ways in which those were developed with the use of currencies, uses in particular uh, some important research among the Iboku uh, in, in Nigeria uh, and the ways in which currency, currencies which were imported were stores as, as, and had a very important social and ritual meaning as well as what she calls calculative rationality of, of accumulation. And that's one of the ways in which I, I think about in, 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 in my work. I'm trying to think about the ways in which currencies were used and the ways in which meanings and uses in West Africa related to a purely strictly economic um, process as economists would analyze it. As Gaia argues, currency values in the interface between African and Western economies have been and are contextual. The social context of currency use in West Africa is absolutely vital. And so this context contributes as well to the context which w is, is developing. The way in which it played out, I argue, depends in part on this disjunction between multiple currency uses in West Africa and the I ideology developing in the Atlantic through surplus value. It's very good at the University of Chicago to be able to talk of surplus value. I like that. <laughs> uh, talking of surplus value brings to shape the argument I'm trying to develop. It's clear that what I'm pursuing builds on classical Marxist theory. It does so in a controversial way. The extraction of surplus value, Marx specifically links it to guarantee of future labor supply. In this economic, pict in this economic picture, which I've been trying to draw, clearly, as the uh, transatlantic society expands, Labor is moving the, is from West Africa to the New World, and so surplus value naturally uh, moves to the New World. Now, clearly, this association of Marxian ideas of value to labor is controversial on numerous levels, and I'm not pretending it's definitive or final. I would like to invite debate on the validity of those terms and approaches, given the way in which, uh, as this material shows, correlations do emerge. I do, though, think that a lot can be gained from thinking about the growth of these pattern patterns through Marxist theory, through this, through this clear connection between labor and value and the way in which that is accumulating outside of West Africa through the processes which I've described. The argument shows that, and as the material I've covered here I hope shows, that this sort of repositioning is worthy of further thought. Now clearly it isn't classic Marxist theory because obviously the position of uh, enslaved Africans in the New World is not that of, the pro pro of a proletariat, so it does require some repositioning. But what using Marxist theory does do is show why there might be no contradiction between unequal Atlantic exchanges, growing impoverishment of West Africa in a global context, and at the same time, the growth of trade. How do we explain this what, on an ordinary economic model in 2014 seems to be a conundrum? the growth of trade, the growth of exchange, and the growth of impoverishment. To conclude, when I discussed with a, a Guyanese colleague in the UK what I was going to say this evening, he made a facetious but also rather a true remark. He said what I was really trying to do was show how cocaine and copper formed part of a continuum in West African history. In a way, that's true. Cocaine has been a form of hard currency in Guinea-Bissau in the last few years. The emergence of Guinea-Bissau is what some analysts call a narco-state, which is a deeply contested term, but has a, elements of truth. Emergence of that is linked to the ways in which military and political elites within the country were able to use cocaine as a means to buy personal access to global surfaces. It was a sort of currency, just as other forms of imports in the past were also forms of currency through which African elites were able to entrench money and status. What comes to mind is Walter Rodney's analysis in how Europe underdeveloped Africa. That the history of African interchanges with Europe is one of African and European elites benefit at the expense of the African poor. The analysis of Rodney and other dependency theories such as Andre Gunder Frank was comprehensively challenged of course for failing to allow scope for African agency and this paved the way for the direction in which scholarship has gone in the past few decades. 
in which economic analyses such as that which I've attempted this evening have become less and less usual. But as the analysis I've tried to put forward suggests, it may be time to reconsider the relationship between agency and economic history. I think particularly we ought to ask what work these ideas and analyses are doing. And what I'd like to suggest by way of conclusion is that the discourse of agency and the discourse on economic roots of inequalities, which I've presented this evening, are actually doing very different work. And we need to do both. But it's a real mistake if work on one precludes the importance of the other, as has tended to be the case in the last 15 or 20 years. So what different sorts of work are both discourses attempting? Now, as I pointed out in my, in, in my monograph, the importance of the idea of agency emerged because of the way in which West Africa and West Africans had systematically been written out of the of versions of history which used to predominate of history as progress. And therefore, of Africa is not showing any sign of the historical progress and change which philosophers such as Hegel claim didn't exist in Africa. Now, in order to redress this view of history, predicated on, on re irreducibly racist ideas, the idea of agency became increasingly important in thinking about history and historical change in West Africa. It was, as has now become clear, a purely ideological fallacy that this, this idea which existed before. And it was a fallacy built on the prejudice and the ideological superstructure of European colonialism. This, however, as Walter Johnson's critique reminds us, shows up the limitations of the idea. To be blunt, we know this now. In the first place, what is being emphasized with narratives of agency shouldn't need emphasis. It only requires emphasis because of the history of racialized narratives and pejorative views of Africa. And in the second place, the question of this emphasis is a response to the biases of history and the prejudices of the Western narrative. Of course, these have to be addressed. But in my presentation this evening, what I hope I've shown is that the type of economic analysis I've been putting forward does actually some quite different work. That is, instead of being inserted as a counterpoint to a traditional narrative of alleged Western progress, the economic analysis speaks to historical roots of past injustices and present injustices and inequalities. Looking at systems, looking at the historical construction of unequal structures, which underpin the frameworks within which, of course, agency exists, is a vital step towards grappling with the enduring nature of inequality and the fragility and contestation of the state in post-colonial Africa. This is not something which I think is insignificant. There's no silver wand that can be waved to address these structural roots, which, as my talk suggested, has suggested tonight, may run very deep indeed. But my hope is that acknowledging the depths of the roots of inequalities and the historical depths of them may at least encourage discussion. And as anyone who has spent a length of time in any African institution knows, discussion is the first step to solution of problems in many an African context. Orality and oral exchange, not always among equals, certainly not equals in skills of oriture, are a key part of how to begin to set in place different ways, different discourses of thinking about the post-colonial state. Certainly, to paraphrase the famous saying, without thinking about the roots of economic inequality, we are condemned to repeat them. It's not fashionable to see trades promoting inequality and poverty, and that has been precisely the nature of my argument this evening. That makes it controversial. But in the end, historians and those who care about West Africa's past and future need a workable narrative which can explain, as I've said, why trade expanded in West Africa and left the region much poorer in relative and absolute global terms than it had been before the trade started. This evening, I've presented one model. Others will certainly contest it. But I hope I may have convinced you that at least thinking about money and the way in which money has changed over time is one route into thinking about something which, as I hope the talk has suggested, is of considerable importance. Well, I mean, I think if you, it's actually that's a very it, really interesting point. I mean, if you look at what happened when the euro was created, you precisely had unequal economies like Southern Europe and Germany being put together in in, in a framework, and it's exacerbated the inequalities between them. So I, th I think, that, yeah, I think that's a, that's a really interesting comparison. Actually. Perhaps my, my question, uh, well, thank you again. That was a great presentation, and the historical taste that you did in our mouths is very welcome. Um, 
But the question that I have, I have a public administration background, okay. uh, but I am an anthropologist. Okay. So that's the hybrid that I okay, that's that I materialize here. Yeah. <laughs> but when you talk about inequalities, mm -hmm. I do not entirely grasp the kind of inequality that you are referring to. I mean, okay. can it be a GDP inequality between countries in West Africa and European powers? Or are we talking about a Gini coefficient? Or are we talking perhaps about an urban Gini coefficient, which is what has been recently been in vogue in um, international organizations as human habitat? You know, what, what did you think? I, which, did you, which do you think I was referring to? Um, I think more at the international scale. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, of course, the, it depends. I, I think that's a complicated question for historians to answer because, of course, none of these, in, in, none of these structures which you've mentioned existed in the 16th and you know people didn't talk about GDP didn't talk about Gini coefficients in this period so the, I mean one of the things as historians that we do is try and make sense of the past through thinking about those kinds of issues uh, th through concepts which we use now um, but I think that I would be wary of actually catapulting any of those uh, onto the data we have from West Africa, partly because the data we have in the 70s, in, it, you know, it, it's very hard to find this data. As I say, it's taken me like three or four years and more, in fact, of, of, of research. And, and the, the data is very hard to find. And, and one of the problems with, of course, economic models is that it assumes the purity of the data. And that's not something we can, we can do. What we can do, I think, is actually, as what I tried to do this evening, is, is think about what the data we have might be telling us. But I'm not sure that modeling is the right way to do that. When, I say what, when you say, what type of inequalities am I talking about? Um, I'm t the, w the way in which you can measure now, yes, the, the, the growing inequalities that there have been between West Africa and the rest of the world. So for example, if you went back to 1980 and compared the GDP of West Africa to the world, it, the, the gap has, has tripled from what it was in 1980. So yes, you can measure it in those terms. There are measurable inequalities. Um, but the broader questions I'm answering, I don't think are, I'm asking, I don't think are answerable through modeling. If I may reply. In fact, I ask you that question because I think that your main interest is to situate agency within the economical structures. I think that's a, yes, I think that's a very important point. Yes, and that, 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 that's something which I think all economists would like to do. <laughs> but I, I do believe that the question of scale, I mean, if we are, uh, I mean, I'm not trying to push you into telling us what kind of inequality you are trying to talk about, but perhaps what kind of inequality is possible to discern from the data that are available. I think the thing about inequality is, it's a, it, it, you know, it's becoming a major theme in discourse. It's a major theme in discourse. And it's one of those words which is, has what philosophers call fact and value attached to it. You know, it's something which describes something, it describes reality, they call it the fact-value distinction. But at the same time, there's an, an, rather as I said with trade, you know, trade's another one of those. It is a it, trade describes something, it describes a fact, but it also has a value attached to it. You know, in the current dispensation, it has a, a positive value attached to it. Inequality has, is the set, so it's, it, I think it's quite a difficult question to answer because of that ambiguity, actually. I was just to piggyback off that question, I'm wondering if you consider the subjectivity of inequality. So from the African perspective, I would assume that in the 16th or 17th century, inequality is, is vastly different than what a European would consider inequality. And I'm curious, you know, whether you're more interested in basic economic inequality or maybe inequality in power, or inequalities that manifest themselves in the exchange that happens. And rather than, you know, you, you, you talked about these sort of trends in economic mm -hmm. determinism, but at the same time, there has to be something that anchors the ambiguity of inequality within micro histories of these moments, I feel like. That's a great question. Um, obviously, the paper was about economic inequalities. And as I structured it, um, it was trying to in a sense, obviously, starting from the present and moving into the past, is thinking with a present lens, obviously, on the nature of inequality. And your question is, is, more, is subtler than that. Your question is saying, well, how, 
was that of being cashed out in the, in the, in, in the 16th and 17th centuries? And that, of course, is a question we can't actually answer because you know, we can't know how people thought at that time. Um, uh, but I think you're absolutely right that one of the ways that we have to, to try and think about that is broadening our understanding beyond an economic reductivism, actually. Yes, you're right. Econo we don't just have to think about econo inequalities in economic terms. So I'll, I'll do my best to broaden out beyond that. Thank you. <laughs> With the current Ebola crisis, the mm -hmm. health crisis, how is health and lack thereof? How is health? How is health or lack thereof? Uh, I should say, like, health problems in Africa. I know it must affect the economy, but is, what is your idea of a possible recourse? Like, well, I mean, I'm not a public health uh, specialist. I mean, I, 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 it's something which is quite close to me because it, it affects the region where I go. I, I w was at a workshop in the University of the Gambia in the end of June, and we had some scholars come from Furibay College in, in Sierra Leone who, uh, it was just before the crisis became uh, particularly severe. Um, and so after, uh, you know, I, I, I stayed some time, and then after about six weeks, uh, the, the, you know, the scholars went back to Furibay, and I wrote to one of them. Just a few, I just thought, you know, when everything became very serious, I thought, you know, I, I, I can't pretend nothing has happened. I wrote and said, well, how is everything? And he said, you know, this is just six weeks later, the end of August it was by then, you know, two of his friends had already died of, of, of Ebola. And, and that was just somebody I happened to have met. So, I mean, this for me gives a sense. And, and you know, I've talked to friends in Guinea-Bissau who are pretty certain that Ebola is actually in Guinea-Bissau. But there's such a very weak public health infrastructure that it would be impossible to test for. Uh, I have no answer. I can't pretend I have an answer. But clearly, it's a it's it, it is a crisis. At the same time, we have to also recognise that Senegal, for example, dealt fantastically with Ebola. Nigeria dealt fantastically with Ebola. It doesn't. It, there is a sort of sense of doom in the way in which the media is portraying Ebola, which, you know, there hasn't actually been, to my knowledge, any major paper. What, the, the BBC World Service did a great piece on the way in which Nigeria co uh, dealt with the Ebola crisis, but I haven't seen the piece in any major paper dealing with that issue or with how Senegal dealt with it, but they dealt with it very well. So it, it is a mixed picture, too. Well, the doctors and nurses died in the generation. Well, and of course, these were countries with very weak public health infrastructures in, in, in the first place. Yes, so, um, yeah. Going back to infrastructure, so like for the currencies of these African nations, what are they backed on? Is this purely fiat? Like you mean currently or? Yeah, what are they currently backed on? Well, I mean, it, it, it varies very much, you know. I mean, uh, so if we're talking about uh, many of the countries in, in, in West Africa are part of the CFA, which was the, which was the currency which was pegged to the French franc. Uh, it, was the, it, was, it developed after French decolonization and was tied to the French franc, and um, Guinea-Bissau also joined the CFA in the, in the late 1990s. So they're, they're actually now pegged to the euro. Um, uh, the Saidi uh, and the Naira are, uh, the Saidi is, 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 I think, a bit weaker. The Dalasi, again, is a bit weaker. The CFA is probably the strongest currency in, in, in West Africa. Um, back that's, and that's really tied, tied to the euro. Yeah. Well, if it's back on the euro, then obviously, <coughs> And obviously taking into account their government and how weak their government is. And, you know, well, public perception also has a, plays a part in currency valuation, speculation of currencies and such. So, and if they're back, um, if they're back by the euro, well, if they're back by the euro, so are they using the euro in circulation? Or do they have their no, 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 no. They, the CFA, so the CFA, this, the, 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 it's pegged to the the exchange rate is pegged to the euro. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So, this the was. One of the potential reasons why the currency could be so depreciated is because there isn't much infrastructure in these countries to begin with. There isn't much real wealth, or there isn't much. There isn't much to like within these nations themselves to back or bolster the might of, or the strength of their currency. Like, is that? Um, I mean. Yeah, that's a good. That's a really helpful question because it's helping me to think about 
you know, I, I, the, where I, t I, I focused in the paper not on currency in the modern era, which perhaps I should have done. I, I was fo I'm focusing on structures of the state in the modern era. And my focus on currency was for you know the early, the early period, um, and it w and it's something which I need to think more about about how those the system. You know, I was talking about the the depreciation of those currencies at that time. I wasn't talking about depreciation of currencies in the modern era. I was more talking about the structural inequalities which deve developed by the modern era. But at the same time, I can see that making that connection is something which I need to think more about. So thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I know you're focusing on Guinea. Bissau. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, do you, would you compare, uh, when you're thinking about this, would you compare Guinea-Bissau, Nigeria, Ghana, when you were talking, you were talking about West Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, Right. Think of them as being That's, I think, a very important question. Um, it's one of the controversial things in the paper, actually, is to is to make comparisons across a broad geographical region. Um, I think one of the things about one of the reasons why I think economic history is important is that absolutely, as you imply in your question, in the 17th century, there isn't a huge amount. If you know, if you go to Guinea or if you go to parts of what's now Nigeria, they're very, very, very different regions. But one of the things which they have in common is this shared economic relationship which is developing. So we do know that there, there is this, there is a, this, a similar process of import and export going on. Obviously different, different things are being exported. For example, on the Gold Coast you have gold being exported. Uh, you have cloths being exported from Guinea, but but this process of import of currencies is going on right across. The, so that it, on a, in economic terms, that's when so that's why I say that the structure is important because that's when that kind of structural relationship begins begins to bring a sort of commonality there. But as you say, there are obviously very different areas too. And I have two questions. Thank you. That was a very provocative talk that produced much note-taking. <laughs> um, but the first question is, I'm, I would like to hear some more, sorry, but micro question yes. about Guinea-Bissau. And you, you made the point that there's been the, the, the political turbulence in Guinea-Bissau and the efforts that have been made to remedy that have avoided structural issues and in some ways exacerbated them and made them worse. Mm -hmm. And I just was wondering if you could give us some more specific examples about that. That's the first question. Okay, yes. The second question goes in a very different direction because you can joke to hand Pomerantz and great divergence. Mm -hmm. And if colonialism and coal made the UK great and the leading economic power and gave it the Industrial Revolution, mm -hmm. and in the same era we have increased volume of trade impoverishes Africa, mm -hmm. but at, the, the specific factors in that then are the, the, the structure of the trade. I'm, I'm just trying to think. I mean, mm -hmm. Ken Pomerantz, it's so clean. Colonialism and coal. So is it rise of monopoly trade, mm -hmm. decrease of uh, mixed trade, mm -hmm. and reduction in currency, sort of the, the evolution, yeah. the use of work. Would those sort of be the three factors that then combine? And if, the, if those are the correct factors, or the... Yes. Tool them. At what point is, is, the, is the divergence? Okay. Um, the first question, um, specific examples about Guinea. Um, well, I mean, there's been this mantra, particularly in the EU, actually, about what's called security sector reform. So there's been this idea that in Guinea, the problem in Guinea is the army. The army is too powerful. And why is the army too, why is the army so powerful? You know, it's true, it's, it's uh, comparatively to its size, it's got a, it's one of the smallest populations in, in Africa, in the whole of Africa actually, the popul population of Guinea is less, less than two million. Uh, and comparatively it has a large army. And the reason for that is the history of the colonial war against the Portuguese, um, the fact that, uh, but due to the, you know, this long colonial war which went on from 1963 to 1974, left a legacy of the army as the, the, the peacemakers. The army is the people who won independence and a huge, um, and, and gave it a huge status in the country. Um, so the idea that the army is the root of the problem 
means that there have been repeated attempts to bring people in, to train military officers, to do this, that, and the other. And this has is, this is had no effect. And why has it had no effect? Well, partly because of the increase in the drugs trade. Partly, though, because it, it's a real failure, I think, to understand the classic theories of, 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 of state building. You know, uh, what, it's, it's, it's the army, it's the state which secures order. And that's what the army did in Guinea. It secured order, it won the state. And so I see the army in Guinea as part of the solution, not part of the problem. Uh, but, the, but the constant mantra through think tanks and through government that you know, we've got to sort out the army has, has, has actually, in some ways, I think, provoked some of the tensions which have, which have, 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 have continued after that. Second question. What are the factors? And you know, I'm, I'm still thinking about that. And you know, when did, I, I, I think though that inflation, I think, is important. Inflation expands the market, it expands demand, um, and has a massive economic impact in where, in, 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 in all these part, different parts of West Africa where, where where these currencies are being imported into. Um, and what is the consequence of expanding the market? Well, you expand trade. The one, one of the things we know, if we take the period from 1600 to 1700, is as I've said, in 1600, you actually have a mixed trading economy in West Africa. You know, actually, the slave trade doesn't predominate. Uh, you have all sorts of different things, including, as I've said, manufacturing exports. And by 1700, you don't. Um, I, I, so I would, I would see those processes are connected, and maybe 1700 is a time when um, the impact of these exchanges has had its day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is sort of um, broadening uh, the region that you're working on a bit too much, but I'm always struck by, in these conversations, um, the encounter is, you know, it sort of poses a rupture between Africa and then Europeans coming and the slave trade. Um, but what about other slave economies? Like mm -hmm. I'm thinking, of course, about you know the massive Arab the slave Indian economy Ocean, yeah. in Western Africa and Central Africa. East, I mean, it's all over. But mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering what role does that play in your thinking about this? How is it just a matter of scale? Is it just that the scale is so much larger? Well, if, not at all, actually. Uh, interesting question. Um, I was discussing with a, a colleague at, um, just the other day who works on the Indian Ocean economy. And he, he, he read some of this material. And he said, you know, it's really fascinating because I find exactly the same pattern in the Indian Ocean economy. And actually, what you have in absolutely virtually identical to what I presented here about the expansion of the cloth traders. And you have in the 16th century in um, the Indian Ocean economy, he, 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 he said, you know, you have a massive dumping of Indian cloth in East Africa, which um, really damages local production. And he said, you know, when I read your paper, I saw a lot of the same processes happening. So, yes, we shouldn't. I mean, so my paper is about West Africa because I am a, somebody who works on different parts of West Africa. But... Um, it doesn't mean that it's the only part of Africa in which this, is, this process was happening. And it's actually probably very significant that actually at the same period, he says this is actually something which happened in the 16th century in East Africa, it's happening at the same period. It's probably very significant that that's the case. Yeah. Um, I was actually wondering about, uh, within your paper, is, do you see any sort of a rural-urban divide in the trajectory of the inequalities experienced mm -hmm. in your research area. Mm -hmm. So thinking about how, uh, and I don't know how appropriate this is to the earlier part of your work, but right. certainly in the, in the more modern period, you'll see a greater access mm -hmm. to trade and larger trade in urban areas than rural, at least for international trade. Does that affect the trajectory regionally at all, or uh, I don't even know how, how you Go well, I mean, data for that uh, versus the national scale. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not some. I'm not the right person to ask that question to. Really. It's not. It's not an aspect that I, I, I work on in Guinea. You know, there is only really one major urban area, which is Bissau, um, because the other urban areas are very, very small. Uh, uh, certainly, um, 
as you say, access to trade is certainly to totally connected in, in you know, 21st century economies to uh, urbanism. Um, but not being, a, not being a sociologist, or I haven't studied how that relates to urban inequality. I'm happy if you're happy. <laughs> 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 <laughs>